Welcome back to the program. You're the first female president of Brazil, a country of more than 200 million people, the engine of Latin America. Your economy is bigger by far than the rest of this continent. Did you always dream of being president? <clears throat> no. No, I never dreamed of being the president. In fact, your story would suggest exactly the opposite because you were an urban guerrilla during the 1960s fighting and resisting the military dictatorship. Did you always dream of being a Robin Hood? No, no, no. It's very difficult to live under a dictatorship. Dictatorship limits your dreams. And when one has no right to express oneself or to organize your efforts, any act of disagreement becomes an act of opposition under dictatorship. In Brazil, the right to strike as a worker in the past was seen as an offense against the dictatorship regime. And the demonstrations with which we very much coexist with peace of mind today in the past were enough reason for you to persecute, kill and torture the demonstrators. So as a young person, yes, I did struggle against the dictatorship. I'm the product of that period in time, yes. And I'm very proud of the fact that I struggled and fought the dictatorship of the time, because it is not an easy task, really. After all, the atmosphere under dictatorship erodes, corrupts people in terms of, you know, undermining the ability to withstand and resist. You were eventually arrested and kept in prison for three years, and you were tortured. Yes. Can you tell me about that? Eu fui presa nos anos 70. I was arrested in the 1970s, and I spent three years in jail in São Paulo, a jail which, by the way, has been demolished. Well, it was an experience, an experience where one learns that two things are necessary. Number one, to resist, and you realize that only you, yourself, can defeat yourself. I'm not saying that it's easy to support, to tolerate, or to put up with torture. It's not easy to tolerate torture. And you can only tolerate or put up with torture if you deliberately deceive yourself by telling yourself, well, a little bit more, yes, I can cope with that. I can also cope with a little bit more, a little bit more. And you deliberately mislead yourself, if you will, because you cannot allow torture to defeat you. Adversity should not be allowed to deprive you from the joy and the sense of life. And you cannot allow yourself to be contaminated by what torturers think of you. What did they do to you? Well, what they did to everyone who was arrested in Brazil at the time, electric, electric shocks, as well as a piece of wood where they would hang the prisoner by the leg and the knee, as well as the arms. People were hung by their arms and legs on this piece of wood, as well as a lot of electric shocks. It was the worst form of torture. That was the worst one. It's what you might describe as a walking pain in your body, an act of torture and pain perpetrated by one upon someone else is unpardonable. It's a barbaric act. Anyone who perpetrates torture has lost all human values and has lost all the gains we as human beings have established as civilization gains ever since we left the caves. I've never seen a torturing process that has not ultimately destroyed the institution that has engaged in torture. How did it shape your world view? You know, there's just one way for torture not to contaminate you. You cannot allow it to develop anger or hatred towards those who perpetrate torture against you. You cannot allow that to go into your being. You have to leave it at the outer being, if you understand me. You cannot allow that to shape your ideology, your culture, or the way you see the world around you. But let me tell you one thing. Above all, there's one thing I think torture has led me to live life in a more intensive way. I'm talking about the absolute certainty that we in Brazil, we have succeeded in defeating those who engage in acts of torture. And this is not a personal defeat. It's not a personal victory against such and such person, no. It's a much broader victory because in Brazil, nationwide, we have ultimately defeated the institutional establishment that engaged in torture. And we did so by building democracy. Building democracy with standards that are respectful of human rights. In Brazil, we have this so-called lust, love, 
for democracy. And I think that was a major gain I have experienced. I, I can see the passion with which you talk about this and your story is remarkable. There are many criticisms of Brazil's police today that it is amongst the most lethal, deadly police force in the region that in 2012 some 2,000 people were tortured and killed by the Brazilian police. That seems to be still a bad legacy of the kind of torture and dictatorship and, and lack of rule of law that, that you were fighting against. Can you change that? That is perhaps one of Brazil's major challenges. Fighting criminal activity cannot be conducted using the same methods that are used by the criminals themselves, and that is very often what happens. The police services in Brazil are assigned to the state-level governments as established under the federal constitution. I believe we may have to revisit that arrangement and revise that article of the constitution because this matter must involve the federal and the state level executive branches of power as well as the federal and state level justice systems. After all, there's this huge number of prisoners out there who find themselves in subhuman conditions in prisons. And that is certainly one of the most serious problems on our agenda today. Much progress, however, has been made in certain respects. And finally, talking about rule of law, you heavily criticized the United States government because of the spying, all the revelations from Edward Snowden. You were spied upon. Millions of Brazilians were spied upon. Have you made up with President Obama? Are you on good terms again? Is this under the bridge, or do you still have a problem with the U.S. over this and with the Obama administration? Well, I don't believe you know, I do not believe that the responsibility for the spying activity can be ascribed to the Obama administration. I think that is actually the part of a process that has been underway after September the 11th. Now, what we do not accept, did not accept in the past, and do not accept today, is the fact that the Brazilian government, Brazilian corporations, Brazilian citizens were spied upon. And why is that so? Well, precisely because that flies in the face of human rights, especially our rights as Brazilian citizens to privacy and freedom of expression, freedom of speech. So, of course, we voiced that concern to President Obama at the time. What we told him was that every reciprocal act between Brazil and the U.S., which are major strategic partners, every such act would be impaired by information that we were not aware of was circulating out there. We wanted two things from them. We wanted a guarantee that it would be discontinued and it would not happen again. And thus, of course, someone would have to be held accountable. Someone would have to come before us and tell us it would not happen again. At that point in time, the Obama administration was in the process of squaring the circle, if you will, around the issue of international spying activity. And they were not in a position to provide us with an answer at the time. And the guilty were not in a position to provide us with an acceptable response at the time. We decided to discontinue the plans we had for the state visit of mine to the U.S. That, of course, did not mean that we broke ties with the Obama administration, no. It only meant that we were placing all cards on the table very clearly and say, hey, the way it is, it's impossible if it remains the way it is. I think today, in hindsight, I think we've made quite a few steps. Stand by one more moment, Madam President. We'll be back with a final thought after a break.